you guys have to understand just how implausible all of this is. This is entirely implausible. None of this makes any sense when you put it in the larger cultural context. This morning I was in a conversation with National Public Radio and uh, Together for the Gospel came up and uh, in that conversation I just pointed out that there are going to be 10,000 people in this room and we're going to be singing songs that are older than old. And, uh, and, and there are going to be a lot of people, including a lot of very young people who are coming a long way to sit for hours and hours and hours of preaching. Evidently, you guys didn't get the memo that millennials don't do this. But thanks be to God, you're here. We're here. We're here together. So, Mary and I became grandparents last year. Perhaps some of you have heard. <laughs> Benjamin Miller Barnes, born just about five months ago. I now measure my earthly history, at least in part, before Benjamin and after Benjamin. <laughs> As you can see, in spirit, he's together with us in the gospel. But I, I want to tell you why I'm bringing him up here tonight. It, it's for this reason. He has changed how I look at you. In just a matter of months, he has changed how I look at the students on the campus of Boyce College and the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Because from the very beginning of my time at Southern, I have understood that this is a coming generation that will be teaching and preaching the Word of God. But now, I have the great hope that one of you will one day be his pastor. I want it to be someone together for the gospel, someone who will teach and preach Benjamin, the faith once for all delivered to the saints. My father died unexpectedly in the year 2013. Just a little while later, along came Benjamin in 2015. I went from being a son in 2013 to being a grandfather in 2015, and that transformed the way I look at the world, and it makes everything I do actually more important. I think there's something like the book of Genesis there in terms of a patriarchal blessing where I come to understand in a way I could not have understood before what it means to be very concerned for the generations coming. But let me tell you how that ties to, to together for the gospel in a very concrete way, not just in the future when I hope and pray that perhaps one of you will be Benjamin's pastor, but also because right now, Katie and Riley, our daughter and son-in-law, are members of Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. It was the gift of God that Mark Dever and I came to know one another and to develop a friendship about three decades ago. A little bit more than that, as a matter of fact. I've got a picture that I treasure of Mark holding Katie when she was a baby. And now Katie has a baby. And there at Capitol Hill Baptist Church, wow, how God has loved me and shown his love to me in the, the fact that the man who became my friend in the gospel is now preaching the gospel so that our grandson will hear him. We mentioned that the whole idea of Together for the Gospel came out of a friendship. Ligon sort of let the cat out of the bag to a group last night when he told them right out in public that Mary refers to my friends Mark and Lig and CJ as Al's playgroup. <laughs> and uh, since it's now out, I'll just share it with you. So this is, the, this is my playgroup. This is, the, this, is, this is why, by the way, what play looks like when you reach a certain age. And, uh, and, and so this is, this is what we do. And maybe you found a playgroup while you're here or brought one with you. But you know exactly what I mean. To know that there's a friendship that goes beyond anything we can imagine that's rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ and in a different way of looking at the world. Now, by the way, someone introduced me the other day by, and, 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 and someone actually mentioned Benjamin and said that he is a member of Capitol Hill Baptist Church. 
He's not a member yet. That's not how that works. We're about to start another discussion, but nonetheless, that's not how that works. But, but I'm thankful, so thankful that that's where he's teaching. He's hearing the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. When I was a teenager, I got my first book on church history, and, uh, and it, it talked about the Protestant Reformation. And, and I was so excited for the first time to read about the Reformation. I'd had an apologetic crisis as a teenager in high school. I had an atheist philosophy teacher in high school. Yes, I know, it's strange, but in high school, they, the high school I went to, they actually taught philosophy. And, uh, and, and it was taught by an atheist. And, and my teenage evangelical world was rocked by this, uh, this atheist teacher. And it, it, it caused pure panic in me. I did not have any kind of reasoned response to the challenges that he was throwing at me. And so I was sure someone must. And without going into a long story, eventually... A, a, a godly influence came into my life and, and, and brought health it was, uh, and, and brought apologetics. I, I, that, that's how I developed such a, a hunger and thirst for apologetics is because it was life or death as a 16 and 17-year-old. And as a part of that, coming to understand the defense of the faith and coming to understand for the first time something that was really, really important to me when I was 16, 17 years old, for the very first time to understand that there had been a... a There had been the affirmation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There had been Christians throughout the centuries who had had to struggle with these issues and try to to think about them. So I wanted to know, what had they taught? What had they believed? How How do we explain the church as it arrives? So I got this book on church history, the very first book on church history I ever ever read, and it was written by an evangelical, and it presented the Protestant Reformation. That was the first book on church history I ever read. Then came the second. I bought a history of the Christian church that was written by a Catholic author. It did not talk about the Reformation. It talked about the Protestant revolt. Now wait just a minute. In volume one, it was a Reformation. A glorious reformation, a reformation recovering the gospel and, 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 and reforming the church and Now I had a book that described the Protestant revolt as if the the whole thing came down to a revolt against the hierarchy and the authority and the universality of the Roman Catholic Church and its magisterium and, and especially the Pope. Now I had a whole new apologetic crisis. Was it the Protestant revolt? Or was it the Protestant Reformation? Because when when you consider that question, how you answer it's going to determine whether or not you're Catholic or Protestant. Because if it's merely a revolt, then it was a revolt against the one true church that still makes universal claims and is still the vessel of salvation on earth. If on the other hand it was a Reformation, we have a very different story to tell. We are here because we believe it was not merely the Protestant revolt, that indeed it was the Protestant Reformation. And we are here to say, we're still at it. As Ligon made very clear, this is a a Reformation that not only is continuing, but must continue. That gets to a very crucial issue, because sometimes words that sound good turn out to have a very negative effect. For instance, Semper reformanda, always reforming. Is that true? Of course it's true, but you need to recognize that was the theme of Protestant liberalism, is that the Reformation is continued by a theological reformation that means that that you accommodate the Christian gospel and all of our truth claims to the anti-supernaturalistic worldview of the culture around us. And so in the name of supposedly continuing the Reformation, Semper reformanda became a slogan for theological denial and theological liberalism, theological accommodationism, not for belief but for unbelief. It turns out that the Dutch Reformed had had a major controversy over this a century before Protestant liberalism came along. And the right side in that controversy insisted that semper reformanda is not wrong, it's just not right enough. It's semper reformanda, yes, 
always reformed by the Word of God. That is the issue. So when we talk about the five solas of the Reformation, sola fide, solus Christus, sola gratia, sola scriptura, sola dea gloria, we need to recognize that those were not mere slogans. They weren't even mere intellectual axioms of the Reformation. They were matters of life and death. Men and women were willing to die for those solas because they essentially define not a perspective on the gospel of Jesus Christ, not, not a Protestant understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They define the gospel of Christ. And without those solas, there is no gospel. And the repudiation of those solas, there certainly is no gospel. So, so then when did it start? Well, we've got a date. That's why next year we are looking to celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. We're not going back just arbitrarily in time. We're going back to that day, the last day of October in the year 1517, when an Augustinian monk by the name of Martin Luther, who described himself as an ordinary professor of theology, nailed 95 theses to the door of the castle church there in Wittenberg, Germany. Now, a little bit of historical humility and uh, a careful look at the history of the church would remind us that there were forerunners to the Reformation. It wasn't that the Reformation sprang completely de novo out of a vacuum. There had been those who had been at least pushing against the false teaching of the gospel of the Catholic Church and had been pushing for a renewal and reformation of the church. Even there have been incipient teachings uh, about about justification and certainly very loud calls for the reform of the church. John Wycliffe had already had his body unburied, crushed and burned by the verdict of the Vatican for the temerity of having called for the reform of the church and for translating the Word of God into the vernacular. But something of seismic significance did take place on October the 31st, 1517 in Wittenberg, and that's why we're not only not wrong, we are, I would argue, absolutely right to celebrate the 500th anniversary of that Reformation in the spirit of continuing it as the church is continually reformed by the Word, and in the same sense that the Reformers were so adamant to make very clear that what we are doing is exactly what they declare themselves to be doing, and that is to be contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints, and preaching that one gospel that is the only gospel from the time that Christ handed it to the apostles. When we think about the Reformation, I would suggest that one metaphor for our, for our useful thinking would be a set of Russian dolls. Some of you are wondering, how in the world is that going to explain the Reformation? Well, perhaps you've seen a set of Russian dolls. It's a doll, usually in something of an eggish shape, but there's a face upon it, and then you, you, you pull it apart in its center, and there's another one just like it, or, or very similar. And you pull it apart, and there's another one, and you pull it apart, and there's another one, and you pull it apart, and there's another one. If you pay enough money, it's a, it's a big set of Russian dolls, and it's an amazing thing, because you put it all back together again, and it looks like one, and it's actually several. Well, that, that's actually the way the Reformation works. It's the way it happened as well. Hold that for a moment. Johann Tetzel, as you'll recall, a Dominican friar, had been appointed by Pope Leo X, one of the Medici popes, that's a footnote that's important, with a commission to sell indulgences for the Jubilee, which would lead to the building of St. Peter's Basilica. In 1517, Johann Tetzel was made commissioner of indulgences for Archbishop Albrecht von Brandenburg, a job he took on with relish. Tetzel began to sell indulgences from village to village throughout much of Germany in terms of the, the territory of Archbishop Albrecht von Brandenburg. And he sold these indulgences both in accordance with Catholic teaching and, as you might imagine, making a little on the side by selling some of these indulgences even outside Catholic teaching. He was officially commissioned to sell temporal indulgences to the living in order that they would escape purgatory. He was not given authority to sell indulgences for the dead, but yet he saw the opportunity. You'll recall that the controversy associated with Tetzel came down to the fact that he promised plenary indulgences 
to those who would give a sufficient amount of money in order to lead to their absolution and remission of sins. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Such a deal. Just keep those cards and letters and indulgences coming. You give the money, you can buy an indulgence for yourself. You can buy an indulgence for future sins. Tonight in the panel, we're going to have the chance to discuss some of the great stories of courage from the, the Reformation. There's some great stories of uncourage, too. One of them has to do with Tetzel. Tetzel, Tetzel sold these indulgences, and he actually officially sold indulgences for sins not yet committed. He tended to infuriate people, even those who did not eventually join the Reformation, because of the crass carnality of his approach. I mean, it's one thing to imply, it's another thing to actually promise that you, you buy this indulgence and on papal authority affirmed by the, the, uh, the archbishop, then the, there will be a, a temporal remission of sins and, and an indulgence that will lead to absolution from which the soul will spring from purgatory. But one of the noblemen, enraged by Tetzel, went to Tetzel and asked him, are you really selling indulgences for future sin? Tetzel said, but of course. This nobleman bought one. He then beat up Tetzel. <laughs> he beat him up. And he had already been forgiven. <laughs> but you understand that not only was this this, this, this crass carnality in terms of, of sin, you talk about yeah, as Paul says, is it then that we should let sin abound that grace might more abound? And, and Paul says, by no means. Well, how about this? Let sin abound in order that indulgences might more abound in order that we can build St. Peter's Basilica. As you know, Luther heard about this. It was in the same territory. It was actually in the year 1517. So we're not talking about a long period in which Luther was, was fulminating and fuminating over the, the sale of these indulgences. It was something that came to him. It was actually, as, as best we understand, members of the nobility who came to, to Wittenberg and complained about what Tetzel was doing. That raises a very interesting set of questions. When, when indeed did Luther come to an understanding of what we would call Reformation theology? When did he come to a, to, to a genuine knowledge of the gospel? That requires a closer look at Luther. Certainly, we have to go back to a year like 1517 when Luther was to preside at his first mass as an Augustinian monk and priest. Some of you know that his father wanted him to be an attorney. There are a lot of fathers who want their sons to be attorneys because the father, uh, well, he, he wanted Luther to make enough money that he could support his parents in their old age. Luther, you might recall, in the middle of a horse ride through a thunderstorm, is completely, is completely scared out of his wits, and he makes a vow that if he survives, he'll become a monk, and he did become a monk. One of my favorite statements from Luther is one that he said later when he said, if any monk could have been saved by his monkishness, it was I. Luther was a terrifyingly serious monk. He even scared his confessor, von Staupitz, a senior priest who clearly loved Luther but had seen enough of him on a daily basis in the confessional. This is someone who feels guilty the moment he leaves because maybe he left the confessional too early or maybe the state of his heart wasn't adequately repentant in order that he could leave in terms of a state of grace, but the state of grace wouldn't last very long and Luther would go into another one of his fits of, of theological and spiritual insecurity. He used a German name for them, as you would expect, Anfechtungen. They were, they were fits that caused him so much distress that as this young Augustinian monk, he would throw him himself off of his bed onto the floor in what could be described as an almost suicidal attempt to mortify the flesh. When he was to preside at his first mass, things did not go well. His father, having been at least partly accommodated to the idea that his son wasn't going to become an attorney, but was going to become a monk and had been become a monk, now brings his friends all the way to Wittenberg in order to see his son at this great moment when he's going to preside over the mass. And Luther fails. In the midst of presiding over the mass, Luther, getting ready to say the words of institution recognizes his own unrighteousness. 
his own unworthiness, and he flees, a complete embarrassment to his father. First, the embarrassment of not becoming an attorney, and then not only becoming a monk, but becoming a publicly failed monk. Then you get to 1517. That's just 10 years later. Somewhere between 1507 and 1517, this monk became a lot less monk-ish. At some point, he begins to understand that the gospel isn't what he thought it was. And of course, there are all kinds of hints about this where, where it was. We understand even the textual catalyst for how this happened in, in terms of Romans chapter 1, verse 17, the just shall live by his faith. Certainly by the time you get to 1514, 1515, 1516, Luther is thinking very, very seriously and, and, and speaking even in his lectures at, about, about the righteousness of Christ and how that is the only righteousness that will suffice. And, and as Mark said, at some point that means that imputation, if not used explicitly in terms of that terminology, is what Luther understands to be the sum and substance of the gospel, the imputation of Christ's righteousness to the one who comes to Christ by faith and repents of sin. In 1517, Luther sets out these 95 theses, but many Protestants, thinking about the 95 theses, think that they were mostly about, well, the five solas, justification by faith alone, grace alone, certainly on the authority of Scripture alone. It's not there. The 95 Theses start in a very different place. Now, hold that for just a moment. By the time you get to the next year, 1518, Luther is presenting a much more comprehensive understanding of the gospel in the Heidelberg Disputation. In 1519, in his debate with John Eck, Luther is clearly articulating what we understand as a, as a Protestant evangelical understanding of the gospel. And of course, by 1521, his life on the line, Luther is fully committed to the Reformation. By that point, it is very clear that a schism will take place between the churches of the Reformation and the Roman Catholic Church. The 95 Theses, what were they all about? They were about ministry. They were most importantly about the doctrine of penance. But, but this gets to the Russian dolls. I gotta get back to the Russian dolls for just a minute. How in the world does that work? Well, it's because like, like disassembling those Russian dolls, Luther began to disassemble the faith and practice, the teaching and ministry of the Roman Catholic Church until what he ended up with was justification by faith alone, understood on the authority of Scripture alone. The offense was indulgences. He traced that back as he unpacked it to the sacrament of penance. He, he traced that as the, as the evidence of, of, of the reason for priestly corruption. He traced that corruption back to the sacrament of orders. He, he traced that back to priestly power claimed to forgive sin and to offer absolution. He traced that back to a faulty understanding of the very ground of forgiveness and assurance. He traced that back to a denial of justification by faith alone. He traced that back to the question on what authority would he have any knowledge of these things. He traced that back to the necessity of the sole final authority of Scripture alone. I love the way Luther put it in the Latin, the Scripture is norma, normans, non normata. You just gotta love that. Even if you don't understand it, it sounds great. Norma, normans, non normata. The Scripture is the norm of norms that can't be normed. If you gotta have a tattoo, that's a good one. <laughs> Scripture is the norm of norms that can't be normed. That is the, the, the fleshing out of what sola scriptura means. He traced that back to the question, well, if that be true, then where is the church? He traced that back to the question, what would then be the church's marks? What would be the first mark of the church? The right preaching of the Word of God. By that, he meant not only the preaching of the, the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures, he meant as the, the preaching of the gospel as the summary of all that the Scriptures reveal. He traced that back to the question, what then is the true gospel ministry? In a very real sense, we can say that the Reformation began in a crisis in the ministry, and it eventuated in a crisis in the ministry. In one sense, certainly in terms of Luther's own story, it began in his own trauma in terms of 
his public failure and humiliation at trying to preside at his very first mass. That really is very crucial to the story because it was Luther's understanding of his own unrighteousness that became so crucial, so very crucial, because that drove Luther to understand then what righteousness would suffice. In the 95 Theses, Martin Luther wrote, out of love for the truth and from desire to elucidate it, the Reverend Father Martin Luther, Master of Arts of Sacred Theology, an ordinary lecturer therein at Wittenberg intends to defend the following statements and to dispute on them in that place. Therefore, he asks that those who cannot be present and dispute with him orally shall do so in their absence by letter. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Where did he begin? Thesis one. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, Matthew 4, verse 17, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Do you sense a controversy there? There's a big controversy there. This is thesis number one. Thesis number two, this word, that is repentance, cannot be understood as referring to the sacrament of penance, that is com confession and satisfaction as administered by the clergy. You're not gonna find a full understanding of justification by faith. You're not gonna find all five of the solas by any means in the 95 Theses. What you are gonna find in the 95 Theses is Luther's outer Russian doll, the understanding that the sale of indulgences and all that was associated with that in terms of priestly corruption is traceable back to the false claims about the priesthood itself. And the claim that priests have the authority to remit sin. All this is tied up in the, in the sacrament of, of penance and in the practice of confession. This led, of course, to a break with Rome. It began with an urgent public call for reform addressed ultimately to the Pope, but the Pope would not hear. And instead, instead the Pope eventually brings out the full arsenal of opposition to Luther, eventually re releasing his papal bull, whereby he excommunicated Luther, exerge domine, rise up, O God. As the Pope said, a wild boar has invaded your vineyard. There probably has never been a better explanation of any human being in church history, by the way, than that. Luther was, if anything, a wild boar. And he was set loose in the Pope's vineyard, but he was set loose with the gospel and with the power of the Word of God. What I want to talk about tonight is the Protestant Reformation as a revolution in ministry. And in order to do so, I want to ask you to turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We begin reading in verse 13 of Colossians chapter 1. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross." And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints." 
To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Five key themes I want us to see about the ministry, about the Reformation, very apparent within these verses from Colossians chapter one. The themes are kingdom, Christ, gospel, church, and ministry. First, kingdom. We see this right in verse 13 of chapter one, where we read this amazing summary of the gospel. He, that is the Father, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Can you imagine a more potent, a more powerful summary of the gospel than that? We have been delivered and we have been transferred. Now, note the unilateral action of God in this. Note note that it is the Father who does this through the atonement of His Son. He has delivered us from what? From the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. Evangelicals are sometimes rightly criticized for taking the kingdom of Christ with, with, with too little importance in terms of biblical theology. Sometimes, just like the, the, the claim about Semper Reformanda, how that was misused, so sometimes also this argument is misused in order to argue that the gospel is merely the declaration of the kingdom of Christ without the gospel's clear explanation of how salvation comes to the sinner. But all of this is revealed, and and all of it is here summarized in terms of verse 13. We are delivered and we are transferred to what? To the kingdom. The kingdom of whom? The kingdom of the Father's beloved Son. Most importantly, look at this. In whom we have redemption, in whom we have salvation. And how is that summarized? How, how, how How does this redemption, how is it explained? It is because it is the forgiveness of sins. Now, keep that in mind because, again, that was Luther's obsessive concern. How in the world can a righteous God forgive sins and and, and receive sinners on the basis of what righteousness Luther came to understand, just as Paul came to understand that his righteousness was as filthy rags? The difference between Paul and Luther, at least in this sense, is that Luther had originally bought into a system of sacramental grace and, and priestly ministry whereby he thought, that somehow there was a righteousness of Christ that was going to be infused in him, and and yet following the very logic of that system, Luther had to flee from the altar rather than preside at the Mass because he knew himself. He knew himself to be a sinner. He knew himself to have no standing whatsoever, to stand, to declare a via media that he was between God and sinners here as, as, as a priestly means of grace. Luther knew better than that. He could not even utter the words of institution. But the forgiveness of sins is exactly how the gospel is here defined. It is because we have been delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son that we come to understand that it is in the son that we have redemption. And what is that? It is the forgiveness of sins. After kingdom, the second theme is Christ. Solus Christus. Look at verses 15 to 22. Here you have the classic New Testament passage in so many ways and the preeminence of Christ. In fact, the word preeminence is here. That's why when we think of the preeminence of Christ, our minds necessarily automatically, reflexively go to Colossians chapter 1, right to this very passage because the language is so potent and so direct. He, that is Christ, is the image of the invisible God. He is the the firstborn of all creation. Again, we can think immediately of all the biblical references that come to mind. The, The image of the invisible God, it is like what we read in the opening to the book of Hebrews. He is the exact representation. He's our sole icon. I was preaching for John MacArthur several years ago, and folks know I love culture and art, and, and someone in the church had arranged for me to go to a, 
a very important opening of an exhibit of the icons in the St. Catherine Monastery, Mount Sinai, there at the Getty Museum. That was very interesting. I was there for opening night. Folks were very gracious, and, and there I was, opening night for a display of icons. I wasn't there because I actually believed there were icons, but they're important in terms of the flow of Christian history, and, and so I wanted to see it. So I got in there, but there was a huge problem, and that is that the people who put this together evidently didn't understand how the Greek Orthodox, how the Orthodox Church at large, the Eastern Church, thinks icons work because they put them facing each other. And I came in behind a group of Orthodox monks and nuns who were immobilized because they can't turn their back on an icon and they were facing both ways. <laughs> and it was, it was this instant brain freeze of people who didn't know what in the world to do. They're gonna insult that icon or that icon, so the only thing you can do is stop. I walked right through. They were absolutely fascinating looking at this. But you know, it, 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 it's one thing to, 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 to to understand, as our biblical reflex helps us to understand, that there is no such thing as, a, as an icon. In fact, when Ligon was talking about the problem of idolatry, that the whole idea of iconography, in fact, the, the claim that they've somehow become a medium of, 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 of communication and a blessing between God and, and the creatures, and somehow the eyes are even looking back at you, and there's some, there's some deep theological significance. There is a, there's an innate reflex among the evangelicals that that's just not right, and that reflex is just right. But it's not that we don't believe that we need an icon and have an icon, it's that we understand there is only one. And that is Jesus Christ. He is, we are told here, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He is the one who created all things. He was the agent of creation, all things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things created by him and for him. His preeminence is such that he's before all things, in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, in order that in everything he might be preeminent. And, and how much, how much deity did he possess? The fullness of God in him was pleased to dwell. And why did he come? What is his work? And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. How did he do it? Making peace by the blood of his cross, clear substitutionary atonement, clear, clear teaching here of the centrality of the death, burial, and resurrection, clear centrality of, of the blood atonement that is so, so thoroughly detailed in Scripture. And, and what's the effect upon those who come to Christ by faith and, and repent of their sins? Well, th those who are Christians who, who've been transformed by the power of the gospel, united now with Christ, and you who were once alienated and hostile in mind to doing evil deeds, he's now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. To what end? In order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. There's that absolute righteousness. How is that going to happen? How, how are we going to be blameless and above reproach? There is no righteousness that we can achieve. There's no righteousness that can be infused in us. There, there is no sacramental gift of, of accumulated grace and merit that can somehow add up to this. This is only, only the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. In order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting. So, so th this is that gospel, once for all delivered to the saints, the gospel that saves, the only gospel that saves is the gospel in which we are to continue stable and steadfast, never shifting from the hope of the gospel that we heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven. Oh, where does this go? And of which I Paul became a minister. The third theme is gospel. Found right here. What's really interesting is that Paul says that it's of this gospel that he became a minister. When I was uh, licensed to the ministry in, in the, the, the First Baptist Church of Pompano Beach, Florida, and a few years later was ordained to the ministry in the very same church, the certificates I was given of licensure and of ordination say at the top, gospel minister ordination to the gospel ministry. The, the true definition of Christian ministry we see here in Colossians chapter one is stated when Paul says, I, Paul, became a minister. Of which I, Paul, became a minister? Of which what? The gospel that is now proclaimed in all creation under heaven. 
the gospel, the gospel you heard. And again, this, this harkens back to Romans chapter 10. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. It's a gospel that must be heard, which is why the gospel has to be preached. The gospel has to be taken. The gospel has to be taught. The gospel has to be shared. That they came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ by God's determined plan to save sinners. What explains why they are saved? It is that they were delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred in the kingdom of God's beloved son. And how was that demonstrated? By the fact that they heard the gospel and hearing the gospel, they believed and believing the gospel, they were saved. This gospel of which I, Paul, became a minister, he tells us. Justification by faith alone. Salvation by grace alone. Luther defined this as articulus tantus et cadentus ecclesia. Again, I just love Luther's Latin because he has a way of summarizing it in a, in a very unique way, which is why he drove his theological enemies crazy. If Luther had been obtuse or confused or overly wordy, well, historically speaking, there wouldn't, we wouldn't be talking about Luther as the great reformer. We talk about Luther because he was so clear. Articulus stantis et cadentis ecclesia. It is the article by which the church stands or falls. Justification by faith alone is not one doctrine among others. It's not one way merely of describing the gospel. It is the gospel. And it is the gospel alone that produces the true church. It is the article by which the church stands or falls. The gospel, Paul says, of which I, Paul, became a minister. We're together for the gospel. How do we know what the gospel is? Well, it's because it is the gospel we heard. That doesn't mean every message that might be called a gospel, the human beings might hear that, that it is the true gospel. Obviously, the true gospel is that gospel which, when heard and believed, saves. That's the gospel of which Paul became a minister. The fourth theme is the church. It's defined right in this passage as Christ's body. Notice verse 24 and following. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling out what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that is the church. The, the church is the body of Christ, a beautiful image that, that for one thing, describes our change of status. It describes what it means to be united with Christ. How are we united with Christ? In such a way that our union with Christ comes out of the fact that we are now together. His body. That is the church. Verse 25, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now, wait just a minute. I thought just a minute ago he was a minister of the gospel, the gospel of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now it's the church of which I, Paul, became a minister. You get a little symmetry here? That's how close the gospel and the church are. And, and, and especially when you think about your calling, the gospel and the church are, 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 are so inseparable that when Paul describes his calling as a minister, he can say first the gospel of which I, Paul, became a minister, and then he will speak of the church of which I, Paul, became a minister. He'll describe this ministry, by the way, in terms of sufferings. We need to look at this very carefully in verse 24. This doesn't mean that somehow the minister of the gospel, the minister of the church, is filling up something redemptively lacking in the sufferings of Christ. This is not a reference to the cross and the resurrection. It is a reference to the fact that Christ's church, where it is found, is found normally, even perhaps normatively, in suffering. And the minister of the church, the minister of the gospel is sharing in those sufferings. Paul rejoices in it, and he comes back to this. For the sake of Christ's body that is the church of which I became a minister, according to how? How did this calling come? According to the stewardship from God. Notice the prepositions here, so crucial. The stewardship from God that was given to me for you. <laughs> That's so important. This is not about us. That's another problem that Luther saw with the priestly ministry. The very notion of a sacerdotal priestly ministry, Luther came to understand, puts far too much on the human being as, as a, a necessary link in salvation, not in terms of just the teaching and preaching of the Word of God, nor the service of the church, but rather in terms of a, of, of, of a role in administering the mediatorial work of Christ and the merits of Christ. And, and with the claim made in the sacrament of orders, according to the Roman Catholic Church, that the priest holds the power given to the apostles and 
from the apostles they claimed to their successors to remit sin. Colossians 1 doesn't describe the minister in any such terms. Instead, it's about proclamation. The stewardship from God that was given to me for you, it's for the church, to make the word of God fully known. There's a, there's a, there's a title for you. So what do you do? What's your job? What's your job des- description as a pastor? First and foremost, it is to make the word of God fully known to be ready to rejoice in sufferings on behalf of the body of Christ in so doing. How is that manifested? Well, the fifth theme is ministry because here's where it is. It's the gospel of which I, Paul, became a minister. It's the church of which I, Paul, became a minister. What's this ministry? What does it consist of? The preaching of the word of God first and foremost. The stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Do you recognize that we're never going to finish this? In terms of our earthly ministry, we're just never going to finish it. Now, now Christ may come in the middle of our ministry, but but we're never going to finish it. No one's going to be able to retire and say, done. First of all, we can pour out our lives as the Lord gives us any number of years of service, and we will never make the Word of God fully known, but we are called to follow in a line of godly, faithful succession to make the Word of God fully known and to use every opportunity in our ministry to to make certain that insofar as we will one day give an answer for our ministry, that we've done everything within our power to make the Word of God fully known, to rejoice in the opportunity of making the Word of God fully known. Look at how it's expressed here. What a privilege. The ministry hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to His saints. You ever sat down on an airplane and had someone say, what do you do? Well, it's funny, you should ask. Uh, My job, oddly enough, is to make the mystery hidden for ages and generations now revealed to all the saints. What do you do? I mean, seriously, do you have a business card? I'm talking to the wrong people. You guys don't have business cards. What do you put on your Twitter ID to make the mystery hidden for ages and generations? now disclosed, fully known. And what is that? To them, to the saints, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. How does Paul fulfill this ministry? Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Perhaps sometimes you have a little bit of vocational envy. I think that might come quite naturally to pastors, especially over a period of time where pastors understand that what we do is never finished, and frankly, it never actually even looks finished. Don't you sometimes have to admire a carpenter who can make something and then say, voila, It's done. I talked to a pastor the other day who said he even reminisces about the days when he merely mowed the lawn. And he could look at it when even for a brief moment you could say, that's done. That's perfect. Meanwhile, you preach the word in season and out of season and people come in and they go out looking pretty much like they did the week before. Now, not entirely, not entirely. And, and, and you know that. The gospel minister knows that over time, you see the most remarkable things happen. First of all, just the power of the gospel in conversion, where, where the power of the gospel is evident in the preaching of the gospel and the telling and taking of the gospel. When, 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 when someone hears the gospel and they respond with great joy and they believe and they repent of their sins and we get to see it. But when we're talking about sanctification, sometimes it looks like it takes a very, very long, long time. And it's not only because we're looking at the congregation, it's because we're looking in the Mirror. Him we proclaim, warning everyone. The verbs here are so important, we just don't have time. Warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom that we might present everyone mature in Christ. For this, Paul says, I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. Suffering, struggling, toil. This is why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, 
For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. We preach Christ. So the Reformation was inevitably about the ministry. The Reformers came to the understanding of the futility and gospel-denying reality of the priestly sacerdotal ministry. Christ, after all, is our great high priest. Luther redefined the priesthood primarily in terms of being priests to each other. He didn't deny the importance of the teaching office, but he denied that it was inherently priestly because of his not only opposition to, but his eventual hatred of the very idea of a sacerdotal ministry. Calvin redefined the ministry in the Genevan Reformation as, as coming down to four offices in the church, doctors, pastors, elders, and deacons. You'll notice what's missing is a priest. Calvin came to the conclusion, as did Luther, but Calvin even more strongly and more clearly, that the priesthood couldn't be reformed. It simply had to be denied. And instead, the, the teaching ministry, the preaching ministry of the church held up as the as the central act of ministry and the pastoral application of the gospel and the word of God as the pastoral calling. In the background to this was the understanding that the Roman Catholic Church had gone so far as to teach ex opere operato such that the sacraments are efficacious in terms of grace, even without regard to the state of grace or the lack of state of grace in which the priest might himself be at any point in the dispensation of the sacraments. And, and the reformers looking at that came to understand that the, the, the absolute gospel denying reality of this priestly sacerdotal ministry. And they couldn't have a reformation. They wouldn't have a reformation. We wouldn't be talking about the Reformation if it had not led to a Reformation in the ministry. This leads to the emergence of the word pastor. I mean, certainly someone's raised to you the fact that here's one of the least used words in the, in the New Testament, arguably once about the pastoral calling. It's a pastor, and yet that's the word we use, and we use most habitually when we describe what it means to be a gospel minister. In, in, in terms of the local church, it's a, it's a pastor. And so, so how did that happen? Well, it's because the reformers were driven to it as the way of making very clear this is a pastoral office that takes the form of teaching the Word of God and applying the Word of God in a pastoral situation. It is not a priestly, sacerdotal ministry. Bootser put it this way when he write, those he wrote, those pastors and teachers of the churches who want to fulfill their office and keep themselves clean of the blood of those of their flocks who are perishing should not only publicly administer Christian doctrine, but also announce, teach, and entreat repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and whatever contributes toward piety. Calvin put it this way, in order that the preaching of the gospel might flourish, he that is the father deposited this treasure in the church. Christ, he says, instituted pastors and teachers through whose lips he might teach his own. He furnished them with authority. Finally, he omitted nothing that might make for holy agreement of faith and for right order. The reformers understood clearly it's a grievous sin to assign to a human a priesthood that is already fulfilled in Christ and can only be fulfilled by Christ. They also understood something else, and that is this. It's a grievous sin and a slander against God and his gospel to declare a priestly authority to offer what Christ already freely offers. Now keep that in mind as we go back to the indulgences as necessarily we must. The reformers forfeited and denied the sacraments of confession and penance under priestly control. You see this very clearly in, in Calvin's letter to Cardinal Sedileto. He actually asked the cardinal, if you have the power to confirm mercy and forgiveness of sins, why do you make sinners pay for what Christ has purchased? Now, there's a question. In 1563, the Council of Trent totally defended the Roman Catholic priesthood and the sacrament of order, stating this, quote, sacred scripture makes it clear, and the tradition of the Catholic Church has always taught this priesthood was instituted by the same Lord, our Savior, and that the power of consecrating, offering, and administering his body and blood, and likewise, the power of remitting and retaining sins was given to the apostles and to their successors in the priesthood. And you might say, well, that, that was then, this is now. That was 1563. But the, the contemporary standing catechism of the Roman Catholic Church makes the same claims. As Cardinal Avery Dulles said, the ministry, the priesthood in the Catholic Church continues in its full, quote, prophetic, priestly, and royal offices. Notice that, prophetic, priestly, and royal 
Strike two. All we have, according to Scripture, is that prophetic ministry. That's, that's all there is, the teaching and preaching and application of the Word of God. No priestly ministry and no royal ministry. You might also say, well, you know, this whole, let's not talk about indulgences. I mean, what, well, how fair is it to go back 500 years to 1517 and bring up ancient history? It's not ancient history. In the year 2015, that really, let me remind you, was last year, Pope Francis declared the offering of indulgences in what he declared to be the Jubilee year. As the Vatican statement said, as with other Jubilee years, the Holy Father has instructed that special indulgences be available for the faithful through the duration of the year. Now, once again, the reformers would say, how do you put conditions on what God gives freely? How, how do you put conditions on what God offers and, and has totally accomplished in Christ? And, and for crying out loud, if you did have the authority to remit sins, why would you every once in a while declare a year of mercy, a year of Jubilee? If he has given you the authority to, to remit sins and to extend mercy, why wouldn't you do it all the time? The Vatican statement said for able-bodied Catholics, the indulgences are available. Remember, this is last year, and, and, and it's about this year, so these are still in effect. Make a journey to your local holy door. That's a physical portal in your local cathedral, shrine, or other designated church or to one of the holy doors in one of four papal basilicas in Rome, crossing through a holy door is a spiritual journey that signals, as the Holy Father said, the deep desire for true conversion. Go to confession, receive the Holy Eucharist with reflection of mercy, make a profession of faith. That's not what we mean by a profession of faith. I mean, any profession of faith and saying, I believe there's a God. A def a pray for the Pope and his intentions. Oh, my mercy. For the elderly, the confined, and the ill, they can obtain the indulgence by living with faith and joyful hope in this moment of trial. The incarcerated may obtain the indulgence in their prison chapels. The deceased, the Vatican statement says, quote, through the prayers of the faithful, indulgences may be obtained for the dead. You know, amazingly enough, Tetzel is more official in 2015 and 16 than he was in 1517. Pope Francis also decided to concede to all priests for the year of mercy the discretion to absolve the sin of abortion of those who have procured it and those who with a contrite heart seek forgiveness for it. The current catechism of the Catholic Church says this, an indulgence is a remission before God of the temporal punishment due to sins whose guilt has already been forgiven, which the faithful Christian who is duly disposed gains under certain prescribed conditions through the action of the church which as the minister of redemption dispenses and applies with authority the treasury of the satisfactions of Christ and the saints. An indulgence is partial or plenary according as it removes either part or all of the temporal punishment due to sin. The faithful can gain indulgences for themselves or apply them to the dead. This is an ancient history. It's not even just 500 years old. This is this pope this is this year, the Reformation must continue. And the Reformation must mean a reform of the ministry. It must mean a rejection of any priestly, sacerdotal understanding of ministry. And preeminently, not just because that's wrong, but because it robs the gospel of its power. It denies Christ. As Hebrews chapter nine, verses 11 to 15 says, but when Christ appeared as a great priest, a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent not made with hands that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, speaking of Christ, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the eternal, the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed 
under the first covenant. The key question that drove Luther to his knees, that drove him to those fits he called in Fechtigen, the, the key issue that led him to flee the altar in what was supposed to be his first mass, the key issue that was behind his nailing of those 95 theses to the door is this, how are sins forgiven? And Colossians chapter 1 declares these sins are forgiven in Christ. And in Christ alone, he, the Father, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. For this reason, Martin Luther said, no more priesthood, no more sacred old ministry. He said the church must be understood as, as a moot house. It must be understood as a mouth house because what's supposed to happen in the church? We are to teach, we are to preach, we are to sing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are to teach and preach the word of God. The church isn't a sign house, Luther said. It's not an act house. It is a mouth house. Therefore, Luther and the other reformers said, we have only one priest. If you bring forth other priests, you do not add priestly ministry. You deny our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. But the church, having only one priest, needs many, many pastors. And that's what brings us together here. One priest, many pastors, fulfilling the ministry of making known that which was hidden for ages and generations but is now disclosed to the saints. Christ in us, the hope of glory. I wanna to end tonight with one of Luther's own prayers for the ministry. So please join me as our brother Martin leads us in prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, we pray first for the spiritual kingdom and the blessed gospel ministry. Give us devout and faithful preachers who will bring forth the treasure of your own divine word in its truth and purity. Graciously guard us against heresies and divisions. Look not upon our great ingratitude for which we have long ago deserved that you should withdraw your word from us. Do not chastise us as severely as we deserve. Let other calamities befall us rather than deprive us of your precious word. Give to us thankful hearts that we may love your word, prize it highly, hear it with reverence, and improve our lives accordingly. May we not only understand your word, but also meet its requirements by our deeds, live in accordance with it, and daily increase in faith and good works. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, in whom alone there is the forgiveness of sins. Amen and amen.